Right. Uh, my name is Mike Laws. Um, I've, I grew up in Washington until uh, I got married and moved through to Durham. And I've worked, I worked for the corporation from September 69 till uh, 1981, where I put the key in the door and it was the end of the new town. My connection is that I joined the Development Corporation in 1980 and left in 1985. Um, uh, I married my husband there, met and married my husband there, Mike. Well, as I said, I mean, obviously I was born and bred in Washington and um, when I left school, I didn't have many qualifications. I didn't know what to do. There wasn't sort of job centers or job clubs telling you, giving you advice how to uh, find a job. Anyway, I remember uh, my dad, he, he showed me um, an advert for a job as a junior clerk at this new town uh, development corporation. I think it was in the Sunday Echo or the, the Washington Post, if you remember the, the free paper. So I applied for it and um, luckily I got an interview. And it was junior clerk's job. Um, and one thing I also remember is that it was pouring down with rain on the day of the interview. And my dad, who worked for British Rail, he was obviously, he was working night shifts to end the day off. So he took me down. So we drove down to, I mean, I didn't even know what was with all existence, but what a place. A lovely long drive as you go down. And I didn't see anybody there for the interview apart from me. So I sat in the reception and... Uh, and I was interviewed uh, by a chap called Arthur Askew, who was the assistant admin officer to Ken Armstrong. Um, and I can't remember anything about the interview apart from he asked me a question who the chairman of the development corporation was. And I mean, I didn't do any preparation. I was, I was clueless. And it was Sir James Steele who was um, the chairman. And I said, oh, yes, I know who that is. But I can't. Anyway. I must have, it must have worked okay because I got a day later, George Jones, who was the chauffeur, uh, came and delivered a letter to say I got the job. So I started and it started uh, one of the happiest times of my life from 69 to when I ended. And obviously I met Linda, my wife there, but I had so many tales and so many, I met so many lovely people. And Washington was a fantastic success. And being from Washington, when it was the old sort of council estates, et cetera, et cetera, seeing Washington grow from what it was to from like a mining place to what it is now or what it was at the time was just stunning. It was I'm glad glad I was a part of it. Were you living on one of those the, the old council estates? Yeah, yeah. It was an old council estate. We lived at Wharfdale Avenue, um, which is now Albany, really. Uh, and up where we used to live was Washington F pit. So we live right next to a massive pit. Mm -hmm. And I mean it's called slack fields or, or whatever. Um, and uh, I actually went to school in Stanley. You know, I didn't go to school in Washington, apart from the, the, the junior school. I ended up going to Stanley. Um, it, was, it was the only Catholic school available that I, I could go to. Um, but Washington was just, that's where you, you grew up. It was the only place. But, uh, but having this pit a matter of about 200 yards from your, your, you know, your house, I mean, I don't know whether my mum ever complained of any soot or whatever, you know, on, on a washing line, you know, dirty in the clothes. But uh, we, we noticed it, but um, anyway, it was clean eventually. And Albany Village is on there now. I mean, I do. I mean, funny for when I was at school, uh, there was a project and I actually went down the mine. So I actually went where I live. I'd never, you know, kind of been forced. I went down the mine, down the shaft, which is very interesting. Um, but gradually, the, uh, the, the slack heap, um, gradually disappeared and was removed because they were going to build the houses on there. And they kept the F pit because now the F pit, you know, it's the industrial museum, which, which was very good. One of the things I do remember was that when there was the, the minor strike was on, I think in 70, there was a 72 strike, there was a strike or a 74 strike. We didn't have any call because we still had coal fires in the house. So we didn't have any call. So there was my dad and my younger brother, Dave, and me, he said, well, I've got a job for you tonight. So we had to go out in darkness, of course, no lights. He had his bike. We had an empty sack. We, were, we drove across the road into the massive field of the pit. I don't know how we got over the fence or whatever, to collect any surplus coal that would be left there to keep our fire going. So we went to keep no eye in case the police saw us anything like that. But I'm sure a lot of families who lived in that area would have done the same thing. But we came back with the coal. So there you go. <laughs> We got the fire going eventually, you know. But you were you were scavenging, really. When you think, 
Mm-hmm. Imagine that day in the scavenging, but um, but eventually, um, obviously, it was all cleared. Um, we got central heating in the house, um, and then pits just disappeared, and you saw the building go up of the, of the houses. So massive change, mm-hmm. you know. That's exactly what we were. And I'm sure there'll be lots of families who lived in other areas of Washington saw exactly the same thing happen. All these new villages going up, where where they so massive change. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How did your parents feel about it? Were they happy to see the change or were they resistant to it? They never really mentioned it. Um, I mean, they obviously realised things had changed because, I mean, as I said, they, they attended this uh, seminar by Stephen Holly in Washington Grammar School, saying what was going to happen. And they were really up for it because they realised, you know, things had changed. Probably the minds weren't go- going to be there forever. So I would say they were welcome to change. Um, and uh, which has been a massive success. And, yeah, you mentioned that you actually were taken to that seminar yes. at the Washington Grammar. Um, so how old were you then? I must have been about maybe 9, 10, mm-hmm. something like that, uh, 12. And I was born in 52, uh, so maybe possibly 12, maybe 12, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Because we wanted to find out what was going on. And it was packed, I remember. And lots of people asked you know, various questions. It was a massive change, but it was happening all over the country, if you, if you remember, because there were lots of other development corporations uh, building new towns. Yeah. But from our point of view, um, so I think my mum would have welcomed it. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, my dad worked for British Rail, he worked all over but in, in the locality. Uh, so he didn't sort of finish his uh, work and end up getting a job in one of the many factories that developed. So he, he remained within British Rail. My mum actually worked for Timex. Um, down on the steams in the state mm-hmm. for a short time, you know, the, you know, the kind of watch mm-hmm. coming. So she went down there. Um, so it, it was positive, the whole thing was positive. Fond memories. So, um, Linda, from your viewpoint, you, you weren't from Washington originally, so how did you get there? Well, I was born in Sunderland mm-hmm. and uh, started my uh, work and career working at Campsie Hall in Durham. Mm-hmm. Um, and I worked there for 11 years. Uh, and then I applied for a job as work study assistant. And um, I'd all, I was decided I'd left County Hall. And I had four interviews for different jobs at that time with lots of vacancies. And um, I was waiting on to find out if I got the job at Washington. And I'd been accepted for another job. And I kept holding them off, waiting for Washington to make a decision. And in the end, I thought, oh, I can't wait any longer. So I took a job in uh, the NHS, and I only worked there for about six months, and the development phoned me up and said, look, this job's come up again. Would you um, would you like to come for an interview? So um, I then went to the uh, tours with Hall, and again, very impressed that I'd gone in, had no idea of what Washington was like. Mm. I can't even remember travelling to Washington, really. Um, anyway, I went down this lovely drive and the building was very impressive. And, and I got the job, so I worked um, in the work-study section, which was in like a porter cabin uh, off the main building, and it was like in a, a rectangle. And, and in the middle of the, the rectangle was grass area, and I, it was a peasant saw, peacock. They're always fine. Honestly, every day there was like screeching and fighting with these birds, and they would come under the window. And it was, you know, really entertaining, but a bit distracting because some of them would try and fly up and hit the window. Or you know, it was just, um, anyway, I worked there and I met Mike. And um, so I worked there for about a year and then I transferred to the housing department, which was based in the gallery. So I left Lisbeth Hall and then moved upstairs in the galleries where I worked until I uh, had a baby and left. So really that was, I was uh, in the housing department. I was the, I started off being a housing visitor. So what I did was I would go to different, uh, anybody that applied for a house, whether they lived at Gateshead or Newcastle or anywhere, would have to be visited to see if they were uh, suitable to go on our waiting list because it wasn't local government and we could pick and choose who we housed. And the main people were workers. They've got the priority. So anybody who worked for Development Corporation, 
And then it was people who wanted to populate the property. Um, so actually, I found out everything about Washington and all the areas by being a housing visitor, really, I found out about the estates and, and things like that. So it was a very interesting job. And then um, I got promoted and I became, um, like the, I was pregnant, so I, I got a temporary lettings officer. So I allocated then the houses, the people who had been to visit and said, oh, you know, they're simple. You would then allocate houses. And it was really good because we were building Lampton and Aiton at the time. And the houses were beautiful. They were all coming on yeah. line, and you know, I mean, were beautiful estates, and the uh, and people were so excited. And it's lovely being able to give people keys to brand new properties and see what they were like in the estate. So yes, it was a it was a very nice time. What was it like around the galleries at that point, actually? Because it must have been pretty grand spanking new as well. Well, to be quite honest, when you worked at the galleries, you went in through the Lorden bit. <laughs> <laughs> Never really went much into the gallery, so I went to the Lorden Bay because the housing department was like up the fire escape um, uh, on the top level. Uh-huh. So you would only come down to like go at lunchtime. Didn't really spend that much time in the galleries. Um, you know, you were working there and we lived in Durham. So mm-hmm. um, it was, I mean, it was very, it was very modern and looked very nice. Yeah. So yeah, very, very good. Was very yeah, nice. Princess Anne, yeah, she, she opened it. Mm-hmm. Oh, 74, I think. Yeah. yeah. Major. I mean, because mm-hmm. we had lots of, lots of royal visits and lots of visits of important, visits of, of important people coming to Washington, which is part of my job as I progressed mm-hmm. through, through my career. Brilliant. Um, so were you involved in, um, uh, well, obviously the royal visits and the, uh, Jimmy Carter and James Callahan and all of that? Yeah, that, that's right. I mean, after I, uh, I mean, I was Jimmy Clark in, in the purchasing section. Um, and then, uh, Unfortunately, the the line that one of the last he died, and I got his job. Um, and then from there, uh, we the hierarchy from that was this chap called Arthur Askew, who was the admin officer. We had Ken Armstrong, who was the director. And unfortunately, he, he went off ill, Arthur Askew. So I sort of was promoted to become the admin officer. And that's when we a lot Washington was taken off lots of visits by you know, as you say, Jimmy Carton and Princess Anne. Uh, but yeah, Jimmy Carton, Callan coming was just amazing, you know. I mean, uh, uh, and obviously there was a planting of the trees, and there's a, there's a tale about planting of the trees. Because have you heard about the how the, the tree died? No. Oh, tell me this. <laughs> uh, well, obviously, what was arranged because it was very very hush hush, and Ken Armstrong and Stephen Holly they went down to the American Embassy um, regarding this because. You know, war so shush, the American president coming to Washington. Um, anyway, so the idea was that they would uh, eventually end up at the village green in Washington and uh, plant a, a couple of trees. So James Callahan would plant uh, an oak tree, English oak tree, and Jimmy Carter would plant a tree from George Washington, who was the first American president, his his house, his, his estate in Mount Vernon. Um, and it produced a maple tree, not not the cherry tree, which everybody remembers about the George Washington uh, story. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so the tree was brought over, and I don't know if it was Air Force One or another American uh, plane, but it was in the hold when it got here. It basically died because of the extreme cold. So uh, there's a couple of stories regarding it, um, but it was given to our horticultural people, and they kept it. Sort of warm, they tried to revive it, mm-hmm. but it, it was still dead. Um, so Jimmy Cotton unfortunately planted the dead tree. We, we tried to make the best that we possibly could, but that cut the leaves off. Um, and what I always remember is that we got two spades produced solid, not solid mm-hmm. silver, but they were basically silver spades. And the inscription was this spade was used by Jimmy Cotton to plant blah, 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 that wherever the tree was. And James Callan and the other one, and they went on display in Washington North Hall. When they came back from the engravers, whoever it was, it spelt the, the name of Jimmy Carter's tree wrong. But it was still it was still used on the day because it was too late yeah. to change it. And then obviously um, after that, I mean, the, the tree died, mm-hmm. um, and then uh, the Americans sent over another tree a few months later, mm-hmm. um, and that was planted by uh, King Brewster, who was the American ambassador at the time who I met. 
Uh, so he planned the second one, but it was vandalized shortly afterwards. So then a third tree was sent over, and that was clandestinely planted by members of the Development Corporation Horticultural Staff, and that's the one that you see today. But it was, it was fantastic. Yeah. Many American president coming to, I mean, even James Callahan coming exactly. to, to Washington, and it was packed. There were people on, on trees looking down, and, um, uh, and obviously the Secret Service were all over. Um, but he came, Jimmy Carter was very good. He shook everybody's hands, and... Um, it was just a momentous occasion. Right? Were you actually in the village at the time that that was? Yes, yeah. We so we were like sort of on, on like crowd control duties and things like that. Um, that we all when it was all over, we all ended up at the post house mm-hmm. at Washington just for a bit of a, um, a celebratory lunch. Which I thought was quite a nice gesture by the the coverage of the Jim Carter and whizzed off and yeah. gambled London after that. Uh, but it was just wow. Yeah. You know, was it quite nerve-wracking being on crowd control, just sort of thinking about, you know, the, the, the tendency for American presidents well, to get shot? Well, obviously, they, they must have done the homework, you know, because mm-hmm. I was looking around and I was trying to think, would there be, where would there be a sniper? Yeah. You know, but the, but they had, they had it all covered anyway, yeah. you know, I mean, probably MI5 and uh, six, so it was mm-hmm. all covered. Um, they probably thought it was a nil security issue because people were, were lovely to be near the northeast people, Washington people. Um, but you, you, where I was in the crowd, um, I was just at the front, just in case anything uh, had needed to be done. It's the excitement of yeah. people's faces to see. Yeah, and you know, I've got a booklet here, which uh-huh. is it was a, it's a commemorative booklet of Bob Jimmy Carter's visit, mm-hmm. and you can see the expression on people's faces. Oh, you know, this person, famous person. Yeah. Coming to Washington. Didn't go to London, didn't go to Manchester. He came to Washington. That's interesting as well, because did he come direct here then? It wasn't tied in with a wider tour. Well, I, I believe he, he, he went to the Castle Civic Centre first. Oh, yeah. And, 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 and he, he caught yeah. the famous How yeah. the Lads. Yeah. Um, then I, I think he went to Corning's Glassworks in Sunderland. And then from there to, uh, you know, the, the few miles down the road to obviously Washington. Uh, to the old hall, mm-hmm. which is you know it's fantastic, Washington. Mm-hmm. Old hall. <laughs> um, and then I think it was then Downing Street afterwards, right? Uh, but you know the visit he had an hour of it, the village green was just, yeah. and you can see actually on Jimmy Carter's face, I think with pleasure, and yeah. Jim Callahan is so proud yeah. to have this person here um, among you know, you know British people. We had all these famous people coming. I mean, I mean, the Duke of Edinburgh came. Um, but I was telling you tell about um, the, I mentioned the connection between <laughs> Muhammad Ali going to yeah. the Northumbria Centre because yeah. uh, it was a sporting venue, and that was primarily built for Sunderland Football Club to train. Yeah. Um, football teams in those sort of days didn't have these specifically built um, buildings that so would train on the beach at Seaburn, mm. stamina, etc. But obviously, in extreme weather, they couldn't do it. So this was purposely built. Um, the next foot were some the, the built, uh, some football pitches mm-hmm. called you know, the Northern Area Playing Fields. And I used to run the um, corporation football team. So I wrote to some of the to ask permission to actually, if we could use the football pitches for our Sunday morning football games, which they very kindly did. But leading into that, um, Sunderland won the FA Cup in, oh, ni- in, yes. ni- in 1973. And we had a connection because we allowed their players to use our canteen. So when they would train in the Northumbria Centre after them coming out have lunch in our staff canteen. So we were mingling with, but I was, I was a similar fan. Um, so it was just exciting seeing, seeing all the players. And Ken Armstrong, he was involved with uh, Sunderland Football Club. And one day after Sunderland won the cup, mm-hmm. but what I, what I thought was, was very funny before they won the cup, Jim Montgomery, who was basically one of the Sunderland heroes, he wanted to take his plate back because um, he had to take his plates back and put it on the table, mm-hmm. and he dropped his plate. And I thought, well, that's a great omen. He, he's a goalkeeper. He, drop, <laughs> he drops a plate. Um, so anyway, soon I won the cup, and uh, obviously, basically, the hand uh, the North Umbra Centre and that football pitches. And Ken Austin rang me, and he said, Mike, I've got a job for you. And I said, hey, no problem. I said, I want you to go down to Roger Park, and I want you to pick up the FA Cup and take to be engraved. I was 21 at the time. I'll tell you the tale as well, because um, when I used to visit, you know, Sunderland, uh, in Blandford Street in Sunderland, there was Blacklock's Jewelers. 
Mm-hmm. And in their display of all their items, the watches and rings, etc., they put in a, a sort of little display and they put a little notes and they said, This cup was reserved, this area is reserved for the Sunderland FA Cup. Now, this is before they ever won the cup, so it was, it was a massive gamble. You know, could have fallen flat. I always remember that. So, anyway, I went down uh, with uh, Dickie Robinson, who was the caretaker at the time, the old fan. We went down to uh, Roker Park. I was expecting the cup to be asked, oh, so I must go to the boardroom. So I knocked, knocked on the door, didn't ask for any ID. I just said, I'm from the Development Corporation. I'm here to pick up the FA Cup. He said, oh, how are we in, son? So I went in, and it was kept in an old cupboard. The old cupboard wasn't locked, and in a brown box was the FA Cup. And said, there you are. Just, just bring it back when you're finished. So we took the box, put it in the back of the van, and... It was actually engraved in Newcastle, oh, which was, oh. I couldn't believe, but I will tell you why it was engraved there. Anyway, but on the journey back from Roker Park, uh, as I said, we live in Watford Avenue, which is in between. So we've got Sunderland, Washington, and then Newcastle. So I drove and I said to Dick Robinson, Dick, tell you what, look, I said, hopefully my dad will be in. We'll show him the cup. So we drove part of the side of the street and uh, I met my dad with Rick Shreel, and luckily he was in, came the door with our two year old niece, Yasmina, uh, who was over from uh, Abu Dhabi. Another story. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I said, Dad, I've got something to show you. Because he said, What are you doing? I thought you were at work. He said, No, I'm at work. Yeah, I'm just doing a job. I, sh- I want to show you something. Came down the path, opened it back in the mini fan, opened up the box, and said, Yeah, what do you think of that? Got the cup out. Well, he nearly collapsed. Right inside, got the camera, okay. and he took a picture of the cup with Yasmina, the old niece. Mm-hmm. So I was a bit worried in case any other neighbours saw what I was doing, because I would have probably gone into trouble. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so after that was done, which I thought was really over the before, we took it through to a place called Tyne Engraving in Newcastle, mm-hmm. New Sweden, Newcastle. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. I mean, our arch enemy. So I took it in, walked up the steps. The news was coming, and mm-hmm. opened the door. It's full of Newcastle fans. No. They had black and white scarves, flags also. And they spent no. the first hour getting the photograph taken with Sunderland's FA Cup. That's <laughs> brilliant. But I was, just, I was looking at it and I thought, well, you might as well take a chance because you'll never win the cup. You'll never get this. Uh, and then the, 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 then the man got the cup and he, he just put it between his knees. Yeah. And he just went, 10 seconds. And Go it was on. all over with it. So brought it back down to Roker Park. But that is, Did you go back in the brown castle box? Well, we went back in the brown box, back into Roker Park, uh, and that was it. And why it was done is because why the cup never went to Sunderland to be engraved at Black Rocks of Jewels, I have no idea. But I think Ken Armstrong, with his involvement with the football club, uh, said, look, we have a place in the castle who engraves our miners' lamps. Because going back to all our royal mm-hmm. visits and people who were very important, we just give them a gift of a miner's lamp, a working miner's lamp from the mines. So we had a whole stock of these lamps. And Tyne Engraving would engrave the crest of Washington Development Corporation, Newtown. And we would put on um, Washington Newtown. So that would go onto the miner's lamp. And it was a fantastic gift. I would go mm-hmm. upstairs, actually. But Tyne Engraving needs to do all our engraving. So hence, that's why they got the job. But I just suddenly thought, you know, Black Locks of Jews should have got oh, that job. Yeah. Kept it in the sun and not give it to our arch enemy. I find this funny with Washington is the way that the, there's such a strong divide, isn't there, that some people on the same street, you've got Newcastle supporters, you've got Sunderland supporters. Oh, that's right, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, mean, it's, 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 I think that's how it was populated, though, mm-hmm. because there was people from mm-hmm. all around that came to populate the mm-hmm. new town, you know, people from Gateshead and mm-hmm. Newcastle and... And obviously Sunderland and um, Stanley and places like that. So it was a whole mix. Mm-hmm. Whereas before that, it was either Newcastle over that side and, mm-hmm. you know, Sunderland over the south side, mm-hmm. really, really. Oh, so. Who were the furthest fun ones that you uh, brought in, you know, from uh, for the housing? Well, we we only did vi- personal visits up to uh, Newcastle, this side of the water. Uh, anybody else? They would be out of city and they would be referred to by uh, other people. 
right. uh, by their councils. But um, I, I mean, I draw mainly most of mine was around Heaven, Jarrow, Gateshead, which were all like Newcastle fans, I presume. And then it was Sunderland and places like that, maybe Berkeley, Chesley Street, but not much further than that. We didn't. Uh, because obviously people further wouldn't have travelled that far. You know, it's very parochial. So yeah, you, you had your people, but that's where most most people from Washington would have come from. So that's how it was divided. I think. The visits I did were around Jarrow, Heaven, Gateshead, um, Berkeley. It was more that way on. Even Sutherland wasn't. I didn't have that many visits considering. I mean, a lot of people did, but in a week, I would say I had a lot more visits around Bladen and um, all those places than I would, uh, you know, and Jarrow and Heaven definitely, mm-hmm. uh, than I would have in Sunderland. I mean, I did, I think I, I would probably go to Sunderland South one week to visit and then Sunderland North the next week. Right. I mean, one of the, the best things that I always think it was incredible from a social point of view is this was social housing. You know, we built many, many thousands of housing purely for social housing. There were some plots sold off for executive housing and, and you know, private rented. But if you think now, we're so short of social housing now in, in 2023, for example. But in that time, people had the chance to, to get a house, basically, and, and to rent a house, a, a good quality house. I also, and I was so be, be sort of thankful for the coverage for, for doing that. I mean, it's probably it was a government instructor, probably you know, 90% of the houses have to be for social housing. So it's what you know what Linda said, people probably want to move into Washington because they're going to get a brand new house yeah. for rent as a point. They didn't have to find a mortgage or anything like that. And that I think that's a massive success that what the development corporation well, did. The Stanley, the person, I mean, you know, I used to do visits. And the, the houses I visit, well, actually, you know, I mean, even for me, I was quite shocked at how poor the state of yeah. a lot of stock was in all these different places. Mm-hmm. No, the wonder they wanted to move into these beautiful, and they were beautiful houses, you know. Uh, I mean, I think one of the best ones, I mean, our architect who was there at Watson, I think he went to Spain or Italy, um, and he came back and he wanted... Uh, it, it was called it's called the Mediterranean Village and it's down at uh, Fatfield. Uh, you know, near near where Worm Hill is and yeah. uh, Fatfield Bridge. Uh-huh. It's built on on sort of the hill and there were there were white houses and it looks like a Mediterranean village. And that was his idea. And I think anybody who got those houses would think, Wow, this is what a beautiful place to live. I mean Fatfield and Billick yeah. is a lovely place anyway to live. It is. You know, but but these were, you know, basically council housing, technically council housing. Uh, I mean, all all the villages had a different theme, and Blackfell they were called the piano houses, you know, they, they, yeah. because they looked like pianos. But people loved them, you know. Well, I, I think the problem was because they were building new houses all the time. Mm-hmm. The older houses, like Blackfell and the yeah. Masonettes, which were fabulous when they were, then mm-hmm. became people wanted to move off them because That's over the years. years they were old, and then they were building the new ones. So obviously, Black Berlin became a place where people didn't want to live mm. because of the state of the house. There were masonettes, which were like a two-story house on top of a two-story mm. house, and they had the walkways, and became far less popular because people from Black Berlin wanted to be transferred over to the mm. newer houses, and people who wanted to move in didn't want to go to Black Berlin, wanted to go to the newer house. And unfortunately, that's where every... Every council has the same problem, don't they? They have some houses that become, as they're older, less popular. And Blackfell became quite a problem to to allocate, yeah. uh, you know, by the time I left. But, but my idea was that it was, it was something different. Mm. You know, I mean, even was in the, the 40s and 50s, uh, council housing basically was exactly the same, the same style. When... The, the corporation, there were some really innovative people and they designed different styles of houses, you know, in Ayrton and Ox Close. They were all different styles. That's what I liked about it. Yeah. Uh, but they were, they were good quality. I mean, yeah, maybe Blackstone might be the problem at the, the end, but uh, mm-hmm. they were, these were brand new houses with nice gardens. and oh, they, were, they were beautiful. I'm just saying that. And the, the landscape as well, you know, we plant trees and uh, beautiful, 
great place to live. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it sounds like the architects were given pretty much free reign as well. Uh, I, I would think so. Uh, I mean, I think the staff who were employed had great ideas and knew exactly what they were going to do um, in these new designs. Um, and it's, it's when I was at the when I was sitting alone and when I started, you go through all the all the different departments and the architects. I mean, some of them coming. I mean, I used to wear a like shirt in time. They would come in with shorts and like open towards sandals. And we and those in the seventies, it was like long hair and you know. And yet, but I think certain people who dress like that, they're a bit. Uh, they know what they're doing. And they've got some great ideas as opposed to probably a static type person. So lots of the engine, uh, the architects basically were like that, but they came up with the great ideas um, to design these these estates. That's amazing. Yeah, I always remember. Yeah, there was, <laughs> there was some great fashions in those days, but you know, we all wore them. You know, the flares and the you know, <coughs> flowered shirts and. Yeah. <laughs> Well, one of the things I do remember when I started, I mean, I didn't have a suit. I can't remember what I wore for, the, for this interview. And I just wasn't particularly fashionable. In it. Apart from I used to have these, I used to wear glasses and they were like, like gold glasses, not like John, John Lennon glasses, but they were quite trendy. And obviously, they had long hair, you know. Yeah. And I mean, I, I started working and I, my first pay packet was, I think, often about £8 a week. So I came out with about £32 after a month. Mm-hmm. I should still be fair about it, about the money. And I remember uh, after about the first two weeks of working at the Development Corporation, this guy came up and he said, Oh, you? I said, Oh, yes, I'm He said, You come to the disco, staff disco on Saturday. I said, Oh, no, I'm quite shy. No. And he said, Oh, come along, man. I said, Oh, no. And I didn't go because I was a bit shy and I didn't have any gear, really. So I do remember in. Um, it's now Congord, but it's, it was New Washington at the time where we lived. And that's where the main shops were. Uh, and I went down there. There was a shop owned by the Lewins brothers. Ron, Ronnie Lewins was one of them. It was a bit like the, <coughs> the Carnaby Street of Concord. So I went in and um, I was looking a bit shy to go in. So I, in fact, I plugged on enough courage to go in. Uh, all this can't be, you know, the, the kipper ties and the, the loons they were called and the flares and the, the jackets. And I mean, for Congo, it was amazing because normally you'd have to go to Newcastle or Sunderland to get the skate. So I was there for about 20 minutes and just, and eventually I came up and said, them, Can I help you? So oh, I'm just looking. He said, Well, what are you after anything in particular? I said, Well, I, I, I don't know. I just I didn't know what to say, really. And so I was looking at this and he, he was showing me nearly everything in the shop. I must have been an idiot because it, it was so frustrating. <laughs> well, eventually they came up and said, look, you might tell look, me, I'll tell you, look, you know, you've got some trendy glasses, you've got trendy hairstyle, he's put your clothes in rubbish. My advice is, what about buying this? So I think I bought probably a pair of flares and a flower shirt and a kipper tie yeah. and walked out and I felt like 10 foot tall. Uh-huh. It was my money, my first pay packet. And then that took off after that because, yeah, I went to all the discos and uh, it gave you confidence, actually, because um, if you had some nice clothes and modern clothes to wear, then I think I, I went into Jackson's at uh, Sunderland and I got my first suit, my suit to wear, a proper suit to wear for um, for work. And it just took off after that. But I always remember the Loon brothers. They were like the Ron and Reggie Cray of, um, of Washington. <laughs> I just, when, when you look at, you said there were very old shops in, in Concord or New Washington, as it was called. Um, but there, see, that was the only clothing shop apart from a very, very old clothing shop that was a bit mm. further along the street where probably other people went. But for trendy people, that was the only place to go to. Right. But they, uh, if I could go back then now, I mean, some of these clothes, they'd come back in the fashion. Oh, you know? yeah. I mean, 70s gear was great, wasn't it? I mean, you know, the, or the 60s yeah. gear, you know, the flower power and all this sort of thing. Oh, exactly. But, uh, yeah, but, yeah, that was a magic moment. But, yeah, I sort of took off after that. I sort of my confidence, you know, came and um, just go to all the, the, the staff club dudes. Yeah. So where were those discos? Were they in us with her? Yeah, the one got a staff club. So they were in the, the staff restaurant. Brilliant. So we did brought the disco in and uh, we brought uh, like a brew that came and put kegs of beer in and soft drinks. And uh, it was uh, – it was – it was just brilliant. And then, I, and then I know I remember Bob in his interview mentioned there were the barbecues. We had barbecues in the courtyard. And so thought. We used to keep like, canaries 
Uh-huh. Rudolf and Avery. I don't know how or why we did this, but as I said, we used to keep pheasants. There were pheasants. Yeah. Uh, in, in this, it was like called Quadrangle. That's where they live. I mean, pheasants. What, what the connections with New Town, I have no idea. And the, there was another tale because the, the pheasants were also kept in a, like a hutch on at the front of us at home. was a, quite a large piece of land. We, at lunch times, you could play football there, football or play golf, or it was, you know, it was just fantastic. Um, but there was always a, there was a huge tree in the middle, and then beneath that was uh, these hutches where some pheasants mm-hmm. were kept. And <laughs> there was, unfortunately, a fox must have got in, and unfortunately, I think he had a couple of uh, pheasants, but we, we managed to save most of them. But Dickie Robinson, who was a caretaker at the time, he Sent the kid off and said, Look, I've, I've, I've got a shotgun and um, I'll, I'll keep God because I think this fox will come back. So, because he lived on the premises with a lad called George Jones, who was a chauffeur there with people who lived uh, uh, on the premises. So, Dickie Jones spent all night up this tree with his shotgun. And unfortunately, the next day, we found out somebody broke into the county. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I don't know if it was inside job or what, but the pheasants to see it. But eventually the pheasants died. And, and, but yeah, we had an evening, we had pheasants. It was, what a place to work. It, it was, a, you know, like come a party that pheasants who were really. But, you know, but we had the, the discos and the candy and the, and the barbecues. We had a firework display once at uh-huh. one of the barbecues. And I remember that called Dave Hardy. I remember Dave Hardy, uh, who was an architect. And he was going to do, he was a member of the staff company, he was going to do the fireworks. And we got. Uh, a local farmer to supply bales of hay mm-hmm. for us to sit on, so the disco and bales of hay, and it was a, a, a trailer, and Dave set up with fireworks on the trailer, and he was going to, you know, and he, to let the fireworks. He let the first one off, and unfortunately, it took off and landed in the other fireworks, and all the fireworks went off at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> it was over in about 10 seconds. Oh, so sad. No, we laughed. Yeah. <laughs> it was funny. But uh, yeah, yeah, cook your own food, and uh, but the staff club was. Uh, we had a great social life within the developed corporation. It was it was stunning, it was really, really good. It sounds to me, you know like everybody goes on about work life balance, yeah. And it sounds to me like it was a lot better back then. Uh, well, I only well that we had a good staff club. And I say I ran the football team. Uh, we had other outings. Uh, we had a really good social life, and I think people probably enjoyed coming to work. Mm. Uh, because I think it was exciting anyway because you were part of a new venture. You, you were building a new town. Mm. You, know, you weren't just building, say, an office block. It was a you know a new town with everything that came along. Um, and then you had the social side of it as well, so it, it all mixed in together. Uh, it was just a, a really enjoyable place to work. It really was. Um, but as I say, I mean, uh, as I say, my job, I used to go around all the other departments. I sort of knew, uh, knew everybody. Yeah, yeah, you were saying you delivered stationery. Well, that was, that was, well, that, I think well, probably that's one of the reasons maybe why I got the job because I was about six foot tall and about seven lean. Mm-hmm. And I was sat on the, the top shelf of stationery. That's probably why I got the job. Uh, but yes, that's really what it was. It was a junior clerk in the purchasing section. And uh, when the, the deliveries of stationery and office items came in, I'd just mm-hmm. check them off. Uh, and then the departments would put in a requisition for stationery, and I would deliver the stationery to each department um, every Friday. That's all I've got to know everybody. Uh, then you do stock checks, and, uh, and then eventually, uh, when I became the central purchasing clerk, I got the um, that job was to actually basically tender for all all the items. That was really interesting. Then I moved on up to the to be an admin officer, uh, quite high up uh, near the end. Mm-hmm. Um, so we used to organise all the, like, the royal visits, any other visits, uh, in charge of the, the, the cleaners and the, the canteen staff, uh, organising the moves. And then when the corporation ended in about 88, organising the move from there to we ended up in the factory unit on the Parsons estate mm-hmm. because the Commission for Newtons, which is another government building, they took, us, took over. But the corporation had gone and the staff had left, unfortunately. Look, before we made redundant, uh, skeleton staff was kept on, including you know, Bob Hope and myself and other people. Um, to be, just to, to wind down totally. Mm-hmm. There was a few sort of projects, but um, we brought in consultants to, to do them. But uh, it was a total wind down situation. And how did that feel? Um, 
did, did it feel like really demotivating? Well, I, I think it was obviously a sad chapter because of, you know, when you spent, even I think if you were lived there in one or two years, but when, I was there for 20 years and people were there in between that time and you saw what happened during that time. It was ending for yeah. quite a long time, so I think everyone was working towards that we yeah. knew that. And gradually people started getting different jobs, so people were leaving, always getting different and less and less well, people. Well, well, that's right. They knew it was ending and they had to look after the future and they'd find you know, different jobs. The there, was, there, was, there was no more things to design, so the architects would leave, the engineers would leave, yeah. the estates people, you know, uh, they would leave and um, it was just a wind down. Yeah, and I, I, I think people were sad, you know, that was after so many years. You know, I started in 64. I mean, I'll, I joined five years after the whole project began. Mm -hmm. um, so for nearly, obviously, 40-odd years or whatever, yeah. um, it was just, it, it was sad, but um, just mm -hmm. the last life. Yeah, oh, definitely. Just what was done. the last big bit of work that was done by the Development Corporation? What was the last sort of big project? Well, I mean... Probably the house, the, the houses were. I, I would say that the more last village. Yeah, last villages were, were, were put a lot. There was a lot of emphasis on the industrial estates mm -hmm. to attract the industry. Obviously, Nissan, for example, came. So a lot, you know, the, that was a major, major thing. So projects like that um, on the economic side to uh, improve the uh, the office offices. So mm -hmm. the projects I think went from housing to f factory units mm -hmm. uh, to attract you know investment in. Um, so that's, that would be, they would be the last things I think that were. That was, I mean, obviously Nissan was, um, you know, amazing. Yeah. You know, I mean, that, that must uh, was there a huge celebration when the when the site on the dotted line? Yeah, uh, well, well, imagine that it's a massive success for me, not a major company like that. But I always say that um, apart from the, the site uh, and the, the what. what that the staff did to entice him there and the government help, etc. So the thing that took the deal over the line was shortbread biscuits. <laughs> and uh, you know, uh, this, is, this is totally true. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, because it, what happened was, we obviously had these negotiations in the boardroom with Edith of Hall. Mm -hmm. And there were two sites that Nissan were considering. One was in South Wales and one was in Washington. And what we did was, Nissan went to South Wales first and we ordered all this, the South Wales newspapers to be delivered to Washington so we could read what was said to glean any little things mm -hmm. that we could basically improve on. Um, and one of the things w was that if Nissan delegation asked a question, South Wales unfortunately couldn't answer the question that they said they would get back to them. Mm. So when they came to Washington, what we did in the negotiations was if Nissan asked her a question about regarding uh, the electricity supply or gas supply, fuel supply lines, whatever it might be, we had representatives of all the utilities in the next room so that if a question was asked, we would say, well, we yeah, don't know, but I do have someone here from the Northeast Electricity Board who would come in. Okay. And I think Nissan were very impressed that they didn't actually wait. They've got given an answer straight away. But what I think clinched it was near the end. We used to put on you know, coffee and teas and some mm -hmm. came with a box of shortbread biscuits. And I remember a couple of the top Japanese person said, Oh, shortbread biscuits. We oh, love them. <laughs> so I, I think that clinched the deal. The there short, you go. <laughs> short, the shortbread biscuits clinched the deal. But, uh, the funny, one of the funny things when Nissan first came to have a look at the site, and, you know, we organized the bus and all the Japanese people on the bus. And this was, it was about the April time. Mm -hmm. And the weather was great. Apart from the day that actually came, it snowed. It actually blizzard with snow. Went down site. One of the funniest things I always remember is that there, because we thought, oh my God, I'll never be able to see because it's covered in snow. Yeah. The, the, they got off the bus with the cameras, clicking the snow, throwing snowballs. <laughs> Again. Because, I mean, I mean, I know it snows yeah. in Japan, but I think this was just, oh, because you, you, you've got to be very careful. You don't want to you know, look at anything. Uh, a big project like that, but um, I mean, the sound coming was just. You know. They did all those flower displays, didn't they? Didn't oh. they? they put so, all this effort into doing displays. You know, the Japanese yeah. flower displays that mean certain things. Mm -hmm. So that I thought. 
Well, it seems cheaply. Although they, no, what yeah. we did, we, we yeah. employed a lady from Sunderland mm-hmm. who, who was an expert in Ikebana, which mm-hmm. is Japanese flower region. Yeah. And in Ulsworth Hall, when you went through the main doors, you had a big open staircase, a beautiful staircase. Mm-hmm. The top of the staircase was like a windowsill. Mm-hmm. And she did various Japanese designs, which meant something to Japan, Japan okay. Japanese people, on the top. And unfortunately, one of the, what happened was that uh, one of the cleaners was hoovering. And she got too close to the plant and she snapped it. And she actually put it together with sellotape, which we didn't know. <laughs> but to me, and, you know, so instead of probably saying something like welcome, peace, etc., it probably meant something totally different. <laughs> but we, we, we got away with it. Exactly. But, but that on, on, this, on the other the sad side was that um, when, um, another, when Miss I visited the with Hall, and mm. the bus was, um, one of the things that we used to do was, which again, I think it, is incredible. And you see it on the TV today when foreign countries get together. They have their flags next mm-hmm. to each other. But what, what we, we ordered a stack of all the flags of the world. So whenever you had people, people say, mm-hmm. if Norwegian businessman came or Japanese or whatever, when you went down the driveway of Oswald Hall mm-hmm. as a visitor, and it's a dignitary, the first thing you saw was our flagpole and you had the Union Jack, the Union flag, and the flag of their country. So, I mean, I would be yeah. quite impressed uh, with that. But on the other side, um, when the Japanese delegation came for one of the visits to Sothol, there was a, a man, um, he laid in front of the bus. Oh. Because I think he possibly mm. been tortured by the Japanese during the oh. war, and he was dead against yeah. um, the Japanese setting up. Um, so, mm. a very emotive subject. I would oh, say a lot yeah. of people probably in Washington, yeah. you know, would have remembered what, mm-hmm. unfortunately, the Japanese, you know, involvement in the war was. We were, uh, I wasn't involved in that. I wasn't of that age. And it was, you know, the fact that this was to necessarily come in Washington, so many thousands of jobs. Mm-hmm. The mines were closing, no other work. And look, I mean, the success, yeah. success it has now, really, you know, they haven't, they haven't moved out of the country. They've, you know, there's still been in Sutherland, mm-hmm. you know, producing the next you know, generation of cars. Mm-hmm. So for the last nearly 40 years, they have been, you know, a major... That feeling of putting the, uh, taking the key out of the door after you've locked That's it for right, the yes, last time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How did that feel? I mean, were you tearful? Uh, I'm not probably a very emotional person. I mm-hmm. Linda probably will, mm-hmm. uh, will mention, but... Um, yeah. I, I was sort of sad that um, it had come round because I, I had 22 years of fun. It made, it made me yeah. really, it, you know, it, it moved, moved my life on, you know, but... Um, to say, nobody else working there by the end, yeah. so you were virtually working. I, 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 I think, I think what, what just to go back a bit, yeah. you know, in the heyday of the, of the corporation, you know, even after two or three years of me working there when everything was up and running, you know, the industrial estate were going up, the roads were going, washing high was going up, all the was going up, all the house going up. It was a buzz. Mm. Or so many interesting people who had great ideas and it was good. But gradually they knew that it was going to come to an end because the government um, pulled the plug on any more money. They, they basically, they'd done what they'd done. They, they, they built homes uh, for thousands of people. They put in some Brilliant roads, uh, they built loads of factories. The idea was to fill the factories now, and it was coming to an end. It, mm-hmm. Everything has to come to an end at, at some stage. Um, so, you know, the, the brilliant staff, they eventually realised they had to find other jobs, so they would leave. The so gradually was getting less and less and less. Sad. So that mm-hmm. there's maybe only about 30 people out of about hundreds who used to work there. Um, we're, we're, we're at Parsons, this, this particular mm-hmm. estate, and just to tidy up, really, that's all it was. Mm-hmm. The Commission of New York Towns were there. We met there. You know, they would come off record me and see how things were going to, to how to get rid of the assets. All the documents went to the Tiny Weir Archive. You know, they were involved in with all the important documents. We had a man, um, I think he, he came from Peterborough. He sifted through, got rid of the rubbish and kept all the good, good documents, which are now probably you know, archive material. Uh, then we obviously sell, sold off the cars, the, the furniture. So the final day was just to walk, walk around um, uh, a shell with yeah. a security guard looking around for the last time and thinking, well, that's it for me. Yeah. <laughs> that's it after so many years. And that's it for hundreds of people who came through the doors. Mm-hmm. And you just put the key in and then you handed over the security guard and you came home wow. on Friday. And that was, uh, that was it. Yeah. Well, doing the dust it. 
So uh, where did you go on to after that? Or, um, no, where, what was, um, I mentioned Yasmin, my little niece. Mm -hmm. uh, her dad uh, was a successful uh, businessman mm -hmm. and he, he lived in Oxford and he had various croissants, which are basically French bakery shops, you know, cro mm -hmm. croissants and baguettes. Mm -hmm. And the suggestion was that I, with his help, would open up a croissantry in Durham, which was just like Oxford, loads of mm -hmm. tourists, mm -hmm. loads of students. The food was fantastic. It was French, you know. Mm -hmm. We identified a uh, property um, in Durham, um, but it was, uh, I was used, I was, I'm not a businessman. And mm. it, it didn't work. It didn't yeah. work. So basically, I had to find well, a job. Well, the fact was, it, you were, you'd earmarked the property, mm -hmm. and it never got any further because all we know it was, which we didn't do, we were building the Prince Bishop so that the properties that, that identified were hanging on and hanging on, but not really completing. Mm -hmm. And this went on for a couple of months, and by then you'd gone down to Oxford and thought, mm -hmm. and I had no intentions of being involved. It, I mean, he's, he's yeah, a very yeah. successful man, as uh, mm -hmm. my sort of brother-in-law, I suppose. Um, mm -hmm. But it really, it wasn't for me. You know, yeah, I, yeah. I, I've, I've been a pen pusher all my life. Monday to Friday, nine to five, we had family and we wanted to spend time right, yeah. yeah. with them. You never off work if you've got a, got a shop. Yeah. There's no way that exactly. So uh, then I think I just um, you had a few jobs and then you had a few jobs. And locally, I got a job at um, Chester Council, mm -hmm. uh, which is because it, we had a really good pension scheme within the development corporation, mm -hmm. and you know, you know, you know along so then with and good good pension. But I needed that to carry on. Yeah. So for a few years, I didn't have a, a pension. Mm. But look, I got a job at Chessie through District Council to continue the pension scheme, and that was uh, that was it. So you were probably working at the uh, Chester Council, where that that was a bit of new architecture that was very divisive, wasn't it? The Chester Street Civic Centre. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it was all, yeah. it was all open plan, mm. which was yeah. very unusual, uh -huh. but weird because mm -hmm. uh, you know when you when you work in a, an office, mm -hmm. you know, say for example, you know when the phone rang. The phone could ring right in the far end of Civic Centre, and well, nobody would answer it. And I'm thinking, that's, you know, so you sort of like look up and answer the phone. Yeah. It was like a bit, it's like a warehouse, that's probably what it was. Um, the, the heating was terrible. Um, but you, you, you got used to it. You yeah. Know? Um, um, and I, 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 well, I well, thoroughly enjoyed it. Well, I, I, loved it. I worked in the, housing uh, in the housing department, and it was. Um, just so it became full circle. I, I, I loved the job. I really did love the job yeah. and because um, they, then um, they sort of privatised the housing, they, like what they did with the developed corporation housing because Sunderland Borough Council took over the housing mm -hmm. our housing stopped and um, we became privatised. Yeah. Uh, so we left there and moved to the Boers offices at Lambton. I don't know if you know, um, you know. Lord really, Lambton's uh, estate. Lord Lambton's right. estate. All right, uh -huh. So. Yes. <laughs> I've worked with some fantastic places, exactly. surrounded by Green Real London yes. Castle. Worked yeah. there for a few years. It was unbelievable. I've been very, very lucky. But uh, then, then, then I retired in about 2010, I think it was. Mm -hmm. 2010. Right time to go. Yeah. But uh, well, I've had a fantastic career. I was some great. I met some great so, people. Yeah. I had a year of Summit Football Club, which was utterly wow. amazing. I was in Our Friends in the North, claimed the fame. Mm -hmm. I mean, I worked with Daniel Craig. <laughs> no, no, I didn't. <laughs> I, I never got to see. Uh, it was I was an extra. Yeah. But, so, uh, but I'm on the which scene were you in? Uh, <clears throat> the one where uh, it's, a, it's an actor called William Bradley. Or, no, David called David Bradley. Right. Uh, he's in the Harry Potter films. Mm -hmm. And uh, other, he's, he's a you'll, you'll know who he is. A very crappy faced man. Yeah. But he was he played the part of a, um, an independent Labour MP. Oh, yes. Uh, kind of did. And the filming was at uh, Wars End Town Hall because mm -hmm. it was a very old 60s, mm -hmm. still is a 60s building. And it's a long story. But anyway, I, I, got this, I was going to be the Conservative uh, candidate. So one of the funniest days I've ever had. It was, it was so funny, man. Uh, I hadn't got makeup and all this sort of thing. I had to wear this, like, 60s gear. And we got changed at... Um, the Crest Hotel in Newcastle mm -hmm. and it got shipped off from Wall's End and, um, and basically it was just the, the scene where there was the, it was the election and um, mm -hmm. he was on the stage and I, I've got a foot of it and there were other people and people had to boo me because I was concerned mm -hmm. obviously from Wall's End. So yeah. how did he end up getting that? 
where I was saying, um, <laughs> so it was at a time when, um, I think I was, I was having... So George gently in Durham, wasn't it? I don't know. What were the no, no, it was nothing, before that. Nothing better. No, it was somebody who I knew whose wife ran an, oh. an, an extra mm. company, you know, to mm. provide extra for TV programs. Yeah. We were going chatting about different things and he said, actually, there's a BBC program coming up and I, I know what I want. Um, I must have, I must have looked canny in my suit. Yeah, you know. There you go. So that's and that. Actually, the, yeah, it's a the one the conservative MP. I think you look the part. So yeah, I just he rang us up. He said, "Right, do you want, do you want to find some dinner?" So I'm like, "Yeah, for a laugh." It isn't for a laugh. We had to meet the Crest Hotel and get changed, and then uh, they shipped us to Wall's End. Mm-hmm. It was just, you know, in life, I think you know you, you take certain opportunities so you can remember things. It was a good laugh. It really was a good laugh. And you two have got form with this, haven't you? Because uh, can you tell me a bit about what you were saying before about the Washington family? So, oh, yeah. that was literally I was working. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was working then at County Hall somewhere, uh, just uh, covering maternity leave. And my phone up and said, Oh, I, uh, pick up, I'm going to pick up Alice and pick up you. We're, we're going down and want somebody to film to do this, take photographs. Mm-hmm. Well, what a clip album. You know, <laughs> I bet you did <laughs> I did think, uh, But it was like, I didn't have a clue. I was thinking, what's he got me? He dragged him to him now. Anyway, we just went down. It was, um, we would have, I remember somebody telling us to put wise on and only had men's weddings because mm-hmm. we were supposed to be walking through James Steel Park and these weddings were about. <laughs> <laughs> well, you couldn't see them, you just see oh, <laughs> So what year were you uh, photographed for this? Oh, this that must this, be 1980, about 86. Well, I was born in 84. Yeah, so it was the, mm-hmm. it, it, the The booklet was, I've got to use it, called The Washington Legacy. Mm-hmm. So the, they wanted to produce a booklet of what Washington had achieved over the years. Uh, and also all the photographs that were taken, they wanted basically people to be in, in the photographs. Mm-hmm. So um, they asked... Obviously, I was involved with lots of things, and the new one you know, recently got married and had a you know, young daughter. Um, so we uh, we went with the, the, the photographer, and that the really, the the realist, uh, who was the grandfather. Yeah, and obviously, uh-huh. call me can't see, yeah. but but this is just—I mean, that's that's Linda, that's Alex, that's me. Just so like a little scene yeah. like that, uh, and then there'll be that's that's Alex and Linda in uh, Silver Center. Yeah. Oh, just as though we, just as though we were shopping, yeah. Um, and then there'd be different ones uh, down the riverside. Down the riverside. Yeah. Sorry, they're, 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 they're in this book list somewhere. Yeah. But but the, you know, the, uh, we obviously had like a press um, department yeah. within the uh, corporation. So um, just different shots. There, there were other great, other people were used, but it's a, it's a nice yeah. memento. And that's this photograph here. Uh, so we planted a tank. It's a tank capsule outside of uh-huh. Hall. Yes. In the late eighties, and we invited the uh, chairman of Nissan to come and basically do the ceremony. Brilliant! And this is Professor Clement McClellan, who was our chair. Obviously, that's me. Uh-huh. These are the Japanese people. And the, why are this photograph? Was, well, it was taken up. There were lots of photographs uh-huh. taken, but the, the box went in and uh-huh. spilled some dirt on. And mm-hmm. so he, the chairman, went in to move the. Mm-hmm. And we were thinking, oh my God, that falls on his head. Yeah. But what I also was funny about that day was because, I mean, I had organised all the, the, the transport and everything, the catering and everything that was going on. Mm. And um, after the tank cups went down and, you know, the, cut the tape, so to speak, and, you know, um, chatted, he went off to speak to, I think, the BBC. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was left with the president of Nissan and his interpreter. They, they left him. Yeah. And I thought, well, you can't really leave. Making small talk. <laughs> exactly. So I just ushered him through Elizabeth Hall into where the reception uh, mm-hmm. in the, the staff restaurant, mm-hmm. uh, uh, no, teas and coffees, you know. Mm-hmm. What do you speak to the president? This, no, I think, you know, you, th- you think of stupid. I think it says something like, um, do you like fish and chips? Because mm-hmm. we could have fish and chips on there. Yeah. I mean, you say stupid things, you know. Well, but, you but, but I had to wait for the chairman yeah. to come back because it's his guest, not my guest. Yeah. But I used to, wasn't talking to the BBC. Oh, wow. I suppose. Yeah. So when is that time capsule due to be open? I don't know what it is. I haven't heard anything, mind you. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting to find out. I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, it might not really have been home. I don't know. Um, some of the things, I remember there was a similar football shirt put in. There was something to do with Nissan put in. 
uh, probably some old documents, some old mining things. Um, but there used to be a sun when that trip went in. Excuse me, they put a sundial mm-hmm. on the front. You know, somebody right. pitched that. So, what year was this? That would be um, again probably about the eighty. Was it Thor still there? So maybe 86, 87. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, it's a shame that the Sunday was pinched because nobody probably knows it. it's there because also Thor now was private housing. Mm-hmm. Did, yeah. did you know that? I didn't. Oh, oh. Well, mm-hmm. when the person was with Hall in the surrounding acres of land, I mean, a massive va- value. Mm-hmm. Uh, and initially, it was, I think it was going to be a hotel. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, mm-hmm. But never went down that route and it was sold to a businessman for housing. And my brother actually bought a house. In, in his back garden is there's a, a wall, a brick wall, which is probably hundreds of years old, and it was, that was called the Rose Garden. Uh-huh. So that's he, he his back garden was part of Rose with Hall. So as with Hall, it was split into apartments for for people, luxury um, apartment, now, isn't it? luxury apartments, mm-hmm. and then built some really big luxury housing front. And mm-hmm. there's another estate, you know, back. So all the land went. I mean, the memories I see used to play golf on the field, yeah. used to play football. So, uh, I mean, the canteen went, I believe. Uh, the courtyard, I think, is still there. Uh, mm-hmm. But, you know, really happy memories, but uh, it's all off now. Oh. I guess you were part of that social life. When did you meet? Uh, Mike, about 19. Well, I think we probably got together as a social mm-hmm. do. What? It was a dance and dom. Well, you, you, well me- you remember about the, 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 the problem of cup Yes, he used to come... Um, but but before then you didn't because I was on holiday. Oh yeah, when, when I started, I uh, worked in, with worked study and I had tea and coffee and uh, I'd heard about Mike. You know, like, oh he comes down, oh Mike goes from there from coffee. Uh, this is before, and um, I remember the cup was disgusting. You know, yeah. absolutely disgusting cup, and I remember thinking, oh dear me. What, what on earth? What on earth is going to drink? So, you know how you have this visualized. Anyway, this really smart guy comes in with a real suit and, you know, all tap. Couldn't believe. He was drinking out of that cup. <laughs> <laughs> drinking out of that. I would yeah. never have put the person that he walked in as, as a person drinking out of this tatty chip stain of <laughs> cup. <laughs> and, I, and I was like, what? Because, like I said, you were a very. You know, clean coat and he had some time and obviously shirt and tie and suits and completely different to wow. what how you make judgments on cups, which you wouldn't do though, wouldn't you? But you saw a cup for a fortnight yeah. and it was like absolutely disgraceful. Yeah. <laughs> hey, shame on you. <laughs> so you used to come down, we used to get together. Uh, he used to come down and chat on yeah. for coffee and that was friendly yeah. here and then. Friendly and that was there. Just and then we, we just started. Just then. got together at the Christmas. And yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. And that was it, yeah. Uh-huh. Going games on the year after. We did, yeah. Married six months later, so. You know, I'd worked in local government before, Durham County Council, and you never got cakes or you know, uh-huh. anything like that. And it's the first mm-hmm. place I went to whereby it was before you went to meetings and there was coffee and biscuits so as a matter of course, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but the washing was always... We, we, yes. we used to employ... Uh, one of we used to have visitors. Um, there was some waitresses brought yeah. in. Yeah, I was yeah. one of the waitresses with Carol and them for one of these events that just needed mm. people who worked there to do it. So. Yeah, if we didn't use the staff, no. it was proper waitress from, mm-hmm. from Sunderland. Yeah, right. And there was a lady called Anne Thor who lived in Sunderland and she had some friends. And so they would come, they would do most of the kit. Yeah, all the it was only So they had the, the proper uniform one. And after the, I used to go and very well with them, but I used to have to pay them. I would pay mm-hmm. the cash. And there used to be only five pounds, that's what we got. This is in yeah. the 70s and whatever. And so, and then they said, and see, see you for the next one, you know, because then we used to have loads of these, you know. Yeah. So it was like a, a good arrangement, you know. We, they were always there. They were never mm-hmm. short of stuff to help us out. And these were like ladies from um, from from Sunderland, and I remember our finance department raised the question about because um, I always remember mm-hmm. this. Said uh, to Ken Armstrong, "Do you know you are operating a dual wages system within the corporation?" 
And okay. Ken, oh. Ken Rock said, well, what do you, what do you mean? <laughs> he said, well, he paid more paid to with tax involved. There's nothing like that. You know, they're not on the books, anything like that. And so, look, they're getting five quid, you know. And it was, it was dropped, yeah. but it, it was raised. But one of the funny things was I used to have the little petty cash chitties and the old cost for audit purposes uh-huh. for, to make sure my petty cash, because um, I'll go and get the money from finance, 50 quid or whatever. Mm-hmm. Then I have to fill sheet in and see where the money went to and hand them in money back. So I get on these little yellow slips, it would have like um, waitress duties, 23rd March, 78. Mm-hmm. And the person would sign them to each, because each lady who I gave them money to, which was cash. And I went back and I was checking them and I had no idea, like M Mouse, G, 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 G Garbo, M Monroe were weirdnesses. I had to organise um, a leave and do for all the staff. Mm-hmm. So we had a big marquee in yeah. Browns Rosas Hall. And all current staff and former staff that we could actually find through records, we invited them. So someone like obviously Linda Linda work, but it left. Uh, came and uh, bite the eat and the drink just to reminisce. So people who hadn't, who hadn't been in the work, yeah. a few hundred people there would produce a proper book with all the names on. And then we've got four, there's a massive photograph. Uh, it must be upstairs, I think. Yeah. Uh, but it was just a great, it was just, oh, when you walk through the door, how are you oh, doing, goodness. you know? And so the, the staff club produced this. Um, it's Washboard. A, it's, it's just, just, just <laughs> but it, just, it is so funny. Yeah. Obviously, the time of the Eagles, so much being in the 88. Yeah. Uh, but some really funny stories. There's a couple of stories in here because I know Bob mentioned a lady called Eddie Wilkinson. Oh, yes. Eddie, who yeah. was a character. Mm-hmm. And obviously, I, I, I met her as well, but she, she'd left. But when she came back and she got a job at Washington Post House. Mm-hmm. And she came back. One of the first things she said was, because she was probably yeah. down to earth. She said, mm-hmm. yeah. You know, son, you know, you know, you know, up at the post. I had no idea. You had to hang toilet paper the right way. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the story in there, and it's about Bob Hope as well, because Bob Hope was in the toilets of Russell Hall, uh-huh. obviously doing what he was doing. And the door opened, and in walked Eddie Wilson with his block. And she said, ah, it's okay, son, just carry on doing what you're doing. I'm just showing where the electricity meter is. <laughs> You know, I mean, oh. only only Eddie could do that. Yeah. They're just like really down to earth, lovely people who know, I say, know where the places just, mm-hmm. just work there. But who did they were all characters? That's brilliant. I mean, there's no one there, a, 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 an architect called Dave, Dave Thwaites. He's mm-hmm. come to work, he's not, and he's not like a brown smock. You know, I was telling you about when yeah. the architects had the, the sandals on and the, uh, mm-hmm. the the shorts. You know, they're all, all characters in the, in the one right. And he was in a meeting with members, I think, of. Uh, probably from some organisation or even some little borough council. Um, and he left the room and he went to the toilet. He had a beard, by the way. And he came back and he shaved off and he beard off. He, he bought a house in Donwell, Washington, and mm-hmm. it was a new concept house where it was, I mean, we sort of all plan here. His whole house was all planned apart from uh, the bathroom. Mm-hmm. And he decided to build a boat. In his house? In his house. <laughs> but he, did, but he, he, he couldn't get it out. <laughs> But there's loads of stories because we used to have things like pot pie nights, which again Bob uh, yeah. mentioned, which were um, well, they were men only. But the last one that the other ladies were invited, and it was just basically to take the Mickey out of staff, and um, so people would contribute little sk- skits and sketches, mm-hmm. uh, hilarious, really, really funny about taking the Mickey out of your fellow workers. And um, what might have been better with hindsight? I I, I don't think. Anything, I, I think it was a new concept, mm-hmm. all the new towns. Um, and I always remember talking to some people later on, and out of all the maybe dozen new towns that were, were built at that particular time, everybody said Washington was second best. Mm-hmm. Milton Keynes' new town was first for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. And I think they had more money pumped into it mm-hmm. because they were down south. But they said Washington was exceptionally friendly, um, efficient. The the, um, the housing and the infrastructure in the buildings, you, you couldn't. I mean, yes, we mentioned about the the road system, you know, the, the numbers I said, which in hindsight probably wasn't uh, very good. But the thing that I would always remember is that I mentioned before about this was a massive thing about producing social housing on a big scale. Mm-hmm. 
for, for people who wanted, who, who couldn't afford a mortgage. And, and that, that was the main thing. A track Nissan, there's not many places a track Nissan. Mm -hmm. uh, we had some other big companies um, that came in to Washington as well maybe with the, the R RCA factory. Mm -hmm. um, it's a story about the RCA factory that uh, that was built. Now, that they produced lots of records. Um, they were going, going to go bust mm -hmm. for some reason. And then Elvis died. Elvis recorded on the RCA record label. Yeah. Everybody wanted Elvis records. Mushroomed again. I mean, it's snowballed again, sorry. Uh, everybody wanted records. So you had lots of big companies. In hindsight, there, there probably will, will be things that possibly, yes, you could have done better. But I can't think, if anything, because I just know that I worked there with some lovely people, some very brilliant people, including Linda, my wife. And uh, it was a total success. Mm -hmm. It really was a success. Mm -hmm. um, it was very sad, you know, to when it went closed, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, life works so. on. I mean, as you say, the mistakes they made with hindsight and the mistakes that everybody makes all the time, like some of the buildings probably, uh, flat roofs, a lot mm -hmm. of repair issues. Uh, but again, the, you know, there were new designs mm -hmm. and you're always going to make mistakes in hindsight when you're designing new modern things that need a few years to decide whether they're good or not. No, I, I, I think it was very... Um, there's bad to be things. I can't, can't think of anything that I, I would say was bad. The house was beautiful. I for the time, beautiful. It's funny, we invited, um, sorry, I don't know, but we, we invited Nissan to a uh, bonfire night. Uh -huh. It's a social event to, to welcome Nissan because we, when Nissan came to uh, Washington, they actually used our buildings as an initial office. Uh -huh. Our staff had left basically, so there were any buildings that just seemed you know, logical to, and they, so they, they worked there. So we involved them in social events as well to create this you know, happy rapport, you know, which I thought was very good. Um, anyway, so we had a, a bonfire night and we invited uh, the, the, the Nissan um, workers and their families who would set up because they were going to start the business before uh, everything you know, came to fruition. Um, so the the, the, the function was the food is set in the um, staff canteen, but the fireworks outside. And I was given the task to say, Oh, God, this look, can he build a bonfire? You know, and then I organized with Sunderland Borough Council to, for a firework display yeah. about 20 minutes or so. So we all went out, and Professor McClelland, who was a chairman, mm -hmm. was trying to explain the story about Guy Fawkes and the blowing of Parliament to the Japanese. Big historical event for the British. I have no idea what it meant to the Japanese. But one of the funny things I always remember, because I, I look at certain things and I think, you know, that's really funny. That one. We had a guy on the top of the fire, and the guy was dressed in a white boiler suit, and he had, you get these plastic masks, like an old man, like an old Doctor Who. Oh, yes. That was, that was the head. So he was on top of the, you know, so the Japanese people are going outside in the scene, a, a, a bonfire. With, with this with this bloke at the top in a white boiler suit and well he's and so the set up the light you know and then McClellan Professor McClellan is explaining the story about Guy mm -hmm. Fawkes etc etc mm -hmm. now I was just thinking that the children of the, the Japanese families maybe go to school and said oh I heard the story about Guy Fawkes and somebody was bouncing here did he wear a white boiler suit <laughs> <laughs> did he wear black wellies <laughs> I think we could have been made it a bit more realistic. So probably in lots of Japanese children's eyes, they think Guy Fawkes looks like a worker. Absolutely massive thanks to both of you. Uh, that's fine.